ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Whitehurst. All right. I have to follow that? Wow. The pressure just went up a little bit. It's phenomenal to have uh, General Shelton with us. He's obviously a phenomenal leader and an incredibly accomplished person. And I think the fact that he is associated and wants to be associated with Red Hat is a statement broadly about what we're doing. And so we're thrilled to have him here to open it. And with that, let me welcome you to the 2011 Red Hat Summit in JBoss World. These are truly extraordinary times that we're living in. And before I talk a little bit or provide some context for what we're going to be doing over the next few days, uh, I want to actually take us outside the walls of this building and take us even outside the context of technology and put all of this in a slightly broader perspective. We are currently witnessing a historic series of events unfolding with the popular uprisings in the Middle East. They're creating massive change, and I believe that the principles that are driving these are relevant to IT as they are to the governments and societies and the cultures in which these things are happening. There's a set of common themes here. People want to choose their own destinies, they're demanding transparency, and they're demanding openness. You know, it's no surprise these things are happening now and, and, uh, and together. So why is Tunisia impacting what's happening in Egypt, which is impacting what's happening in Yemen, and you know, the list goes on. And there's a confluence of things going on now, and specifically technology-enabled things going on, so whether it's Facebook or Twitter or just SMS messages. But it's not just the technologies. Yes, these technologies are enabling the communication that's enabling the networking that's causing this to happen. But more importantly, it's enabling people to interact in new ways, to generate new ideas, to come together in fundamentally different ways. And people, when they can communicate that way, have developed a whole new set of demands for what they expect from each other, from the corporations they work with, from the companies uh, that they work for, from the governments that are there to serve them, and the combination of these technologies enabling a cultural change that's clearly desired along with the technologies themselves is leading to a fundamental change in, in multiple countries around the world. Now, this is still playing out. Right? There are very strong forces working against openness and transparency. Uh, we can't assume that this is a battle won. It's a battle that's continuing and continues to go on in multiple areas around the world. So what does that have to do with what we're doing here? Those same things, the cultural changes, the demands that people are having of their governments and of their companies they work for and their expectations around cultural change are fundamentally similar to and often derive from the same technologies that's driving this little thing called cloud. Simply put, these technology trends are driving an architectural change that I would argue is a paradigm shift akin to the move from mainframe to client server, right? And I'm trying not to use the cloud too much, and we'll come back and use the word uh, in a little while, but we are at a fundamental inflection point in IT technology architectures. And I think we all know that, right? We're all a part of that. That's not what I'm here to talk about. What I want to spend a little bit of time this evening uh, talking about is how this happens, right? Not the what's, not about the technologies, but how this happens, how it unfolds, will fundamentally determine how much value is created and frankly, who captures that value? So we all know the, the, the messages out there. Everyone's talking about this thing called cloud and cloud infrastructures. And you can go on and on and on and on. And I can put myriad data points up here about how cloud's going to change the world. And you know, it, it, a lot of this is real. I hear from CIOs all the time about looking for the tangible business value that this next generation architecture can deliver. 
But they also tell me something else that comes up over and over and over again. There is so much hype out here about this. You can't go anywhere without hearing about this thing called cloud. And it's gotten so incredibly muddled. Let me show you one example. This is a classic. This is from uh, Oracle World last year, right? You know, Oracle launches cloud in a box. You know, I don't even know where to begin to try to critique that statement. So I'll let somebody else critique it. So this cloud in a box is this thing we've been calling a server, right? And you know, the problem with this now is so many IT vendors, so many service providers, frankly, so many companies in their own IT shops have glommed onto this paradigm shift thing happening that bluntly, everyone's losing credibility about this. So I actually asked my marketing department, what are some next steps? All right, and we can go on and on. So there's all kind of diversifications we can do. <laughs> this one, so you remember Charmin? This one actually I think is probably really credible. Right? But you can go on and on and on and on. Right? But seriously, we need to get past all of this hype and we need to come back and talk about what we really mean by cloud and lay out a set of principles on which we move forward. And so what I want to spend a while doing over the next just few minutes is not talk at all about Red Hat's technology not talk at all about our products or our partner's products. But I want to come back and talk about the principles around cloud because this thing is so new, none of us know exactly where this goes. But I want to talk about the principles to contextualize our view of the future direction uh, of technology architectures. And I, hopefully it will provide a bit of context for what we will talk about over the next few days. Hint, we will talk about cloud in the next few days. So, to use a really bad pun here, you know, why is the term cloud so cloudy? To put it simply, I think the reason that this thing called cloud has gotten so munched together and messed up in people's minds is very simply, we're not leading it. When I say we, I don't mean Red Hat, I mean IT vendors are not leading this thing called cloud, right? There is no vendor who came up with, there's no consortium of vendors who came up with this. This is really the first time in IT where we have seen fundamental, massive, user-driven innovation. These concepts around cloud weren't defined by us or any of our other great partners uh, in the room here. This was defined by people running massive data centers who had a set of problems that they wanted to address. And for the first time, because of open source, they could address them themselves. So people like Google and Yahoo and Amazon and others were able to pick best of breed technologies, have the source code, make the changes they need to put this together in their own way. Without open source, clouds wouldn't exist, full stop. But I think an important subtlety around it, and one of the things that you're seeing that bubbling around cloud is every vendor sees this as a big deal, and what a shock, it's what customers want. Why? Because they're the ones that came up with it. But every vendor's running really, really hard to try to say, well, here's my vision around cloud. Here's why you ought to buy my set of products and my set of features. That's the antithesis of what cloud is and what cloud should be which is not about a particular technology or a particular stack. It's about a set of principles that have allowed this collective innovation to happen. It is the principles of the open source community. And so when we think about user-driven innovation, what we shouldn't be talking about is my singular view of the future or any other company's singular view of the future. We need to be talking about the context in which we can continue to allow innovation to happen. Because those principles will ultimately end up driving the business value potential for cloud. And we are at a very significant, I believe, inflection point about whether cloud is going to continue to develop with users driving the direction, or whether some big mega vendors 
are going to co-opt the terminology and deliver the same old stuff under new names uh, that they've been delivering for years. So let me talk about those principles of open source, those principles that I think are the hallmark of what we've done in open source, what broader open source communities have done, what has driven cloud. Three principles, first is collaboration. It's everyone working together for the benefit of all. Right? This is no different than what we've seen in Egypt and other countries where groups of people working together selflessly trying to make change happen. And this is an underlying principle of cloud computing. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating is you can read article and article and article about how Google and Facebook are rivals and how they're both trying to own social networking and you know, they're out there poaching each other's talent every day and it's the nonstop stream of talking about these companies. But what those miss, at a fundamental technology level, these companies are, com uh, are collaborating every single day together. Now, maybe not directly getting on the phone together, but they are collaborating in a set of communities that they may be uh, leading or that we may be leading or others in this room might be leading, but these are components of the technology stack that they are both contributing and they are both getting benefit of what the other's doing. Right? It's a fundamentally different way to think. It's not, I need to keep this away from my competitor. It's a belief that if we all work together, the whole is bigger. Now let's fight like hell about who's going to get what share of that pie. But that fundamental DNA around collaboration is an absolutely critical component that's gotten cloud to where it is. Again, driven by these large users, not driven by IT companies talking about their own uh, technology stacks. And so my comment back to technology decision makers is you need to ask yourself, are you investing in technologies that are built around collaboration where your peers or others running massive data centers are contributing their know-how? Or are you trusting a single vendor to deliver a stack and a long-term roadmap that's truly gonna meet your needs? Second, the protesters in the Middle East succeeded because they did everything in the open, right? Whether you look at what the tweeting, whether you look at Facebook, whether you look at the way they posted, the way they were communicating, everything happened out in the open. Those same principles, or principle, will be a key success factor in this next generation of IT architecture. When we start talking about cloud and this is gonna run over here outside of my data center, when we start talking about the security issues around cloud, all of the myriad issues in, in the details that we all have to deal with, this is not gonna work when you get 10 different vendors all trying to throw their stuff together. If we don't have the potential for people to see the code, to see what's actually underneath these things, where users can go in and find the problems and learn and fix and really uh, define their own destiny, we are not going to reach the potential uh, that we have in this next paradigm shift uh, of computing. Finally, choice. And I, again, I'll use the success stories, of course, but Egypt and Tunisia, uh, are, are people are asking for the ability to choose their own destiny. That's, I think, something that most of us um, believe is a fundamental right obviously. But as an IT buyer for your IT decisions, we all know that in so many different areas, you no longer have a choice. You may have had a choice 10 years ago, but between lock-in and vendor consolidation, all the things going on, fundamentally how much choice do you have? So for the first time in this paradigm shift, all of these traditional sectors are being shaken around and turned on their heads, and for the first time again, in, well, for in a long, long time, people have choice. And how they decide to exercise that choice will be absolutely critical in determining who and how value is going to be created and how that value is gonna be shared. So I'm gonna actually try to take a few real world examples here and talk through our view of the future and kind of lay out how I think these principles should impact the way we as 
vendors and participants in this broader market should act and what, how we think uh, customers and users of clouds and these new technologies should uh, contextualize some of these uh, decisions. Clearly, we are in a fork in the road, and I'll, let me just go through a couple of those. First off, is the core infrastructure of this new technology stack, I'm gonna walk this way, Something, some bad mojo over there. All right, uh, stated bluntly, we are in a phase where customers are simply deciding, well, I should back up, should, are we in a phase where customers in making their infrastructure decisions, are they simply deciding who the Microsoft of this next generation of computing gonna be? Right, I think this is one of the biggest single issues that companies have to recognize. When you're sitting there right now in a paradigm shift in computing that we're in, if we opt for the old business models, what we're deciding right now, we as an industry, is who's gonna be the new Microsoft, right? Typically, in a paradigm shift, there are one or two winners. So, you know, Wintel in, in, you know, in the uh, client-server era, we're now in a fundamental paradigm shift. Are we just choosing the next Microsoft? And if we are just choosing the next Microsoft, there's only gonna be a certain amount of value that's going to be created, and I think we know where the vast majority of that value uh, will actually uh, be extracted. So when we think about things like infrastructure, it's not just about the features and functionality or the feeds and the speeds. We are making long-term decisions for the business models that will ultimately, will be living through until whatever the next great wave is probably after all of us are retired. These typically don't happen that often. So, and let's take the most fundamental choice here, right? Back then, if you want to talk about with the, the last generation, it was about the OS. And certainly on the PC side, Microsoft won that game, and fundamentally, they were the, the winner on the client side of computing. In this next generation of computing, there's another layer where hardware meets software called the hypervisor. Right? In choosing your hypervisor and the business model and what you demand of your vendors, partners, suppliers around this, you are determining whether we are going to pick the next Microsoft or whether we're gonna opt for an open source alternative where the entire ecosystem has choice, continues to have choice, is not locked into a single solution. So if you buy into that concept of I'm gonna buy the, on feeds and speeds and I'm not gonna worry about the fundamental underlying business model, then you are handing the keys to your infrastructure, not just today and tomorrow, but for a very, very long time to a single vendor, right? Do we wanna be open? Do you wanna continue with the business models of the past? Now obviously, we're very, very biased here. Yeah, we believe that you should have the, really, the, the ability to choose. The only rational choice when you have this opportunity is to choose open, right? We're a massive community of people from Google to Facebook to, all, uh, to uh, the major hardware vendors to people like Red Hat to this broad communities are working together to deliver the feature functionality, not of just today, but what these major uh, data centers will need in the future, and they're contributing themselves, and it's open, and it's free. Now, obviously not free as in beer, it's free as in freedom, and you do have choice. You have choice uh, whether to buy support against that, you have choice whether to, to roll your own, you fundamentally have choice. So again, this is not, to me, a, a matter of features, functionalities, and all those things obviously are important, but this is a much more fundamental choice that companies will be making over the next 24 months. I think there's another debate going on, and this is, wow, should the technology stack be about these public clouds? Is that gonna be the wave of the future, or is it gonna be about private clouds, and people are gonna run to private clouds, right? And so. When we look at that problem, the driving factor is your applications and how you're gonna run it. And we can all sit here and have opinions. As, as uh, General Shelton said, we have a 1,000 engineers now, which means we have 2,000 opinions on the future and what's the right way to run this, and that's you know, part of my life that I get to, to, to lead every day. But very fundamentally for us, if you go back to core principles, 
It's about choice, right? In the end, we don't know. You don't know. We're in the early phases of this, right? Customers will choose and different customers will make different decisions and over time, over the next decade, these things will work th its way out. But at this point, we all need to be thinking about solutions that address a broad set of choice and customer needs. That means defining architectures and applications that are flexible. Any rational cloud strategy has to recognize some customers are gonna be comfortable in private cloud or in public clouds, others are not. For whatever reasons, they're gonna to wanna to be on private clouds, they're gonna be hybrid clouds where industry consortia get together. They're gonna to be things that we haven't even thought of yet. And building on an architecture that is flexible, allows choice, allows mobility of applications across these is going to be critical. Final example, and th this is one of my, my favorites, right? Public clouds. And you, know, you have a whole bunch of different models out there, which is great. The amount of innovation going on across this public cloud landscape, people trying different things, some based on absolute lowest cost, others on service level agreements, some for dev and test. There are all kind of models out there. And it's that innovation, it's that competition, it's all of different people trying different things that's gonna lead to extraordinary innovation and ultimately value. But a major question, so well, where do I start? How do I think about, where do I want to develop my applications? How do I want to uh, move forward? The problem today is clouds have started developing their own sets of APIs. If you, even some of our great partners too, so I don't mean this in a bad way, but people like Amazon, if you develop using Amazon's APIs for their cloud, you cannot move that application. And it's a, we use it too, and you'll hear more about it. it, it it's a great um, uh, service. I think it's a great um, uh, chance to uh, playground to try all kind of new things. But fundamentally, if you run a, put a production application in there, you have made that decision that it is going to stay there. You can't say in six months, oh, I'm gonna move it over to NTT or IBM or, or anyone else, right? You are stuck there. If clouds develop that way, it's kind of going back to the 80s. Remember there used to be the vertical stacks, you had the deck stack and these other stacks, albeit on a newer technology and there is some value in elasticity. But if you're stuck and you're stuck on a platform, who's gonna ultimately extract that value? Is it gonna be you or is it gonna be your vendors? So everything that Red Hat does and our guiding principles, which you will hear so much about over the next uh, while, clouds, applications for, for clouds need to be written in a way that you can go across multiple clouds, right? So what you hear from our architecture uh, to um, our services to the way we approach uh, relationships with cloud providers is choice, choice, choice. Write once, be able to have application uh, mobility. We'll talk a lot about that over the next couple days, but it is absolutely fundamental Again, these are not things about specific technologies. These are around your business models and how your relationships can change uh, in this next generation of computing. So to wrap up, I just want to emphasize again, we've watched political revolutions in the Middle East play out around the themes of collaboration, transparency, and choice. As CIOs develop their next generation of technology architectures, should they be de uh, demanding anything less than that, right? Collaboration, not coercion, transparency, not hype, and choice, not lock-in. I think we can sum it up, our view, in one word, and that's open. And so just to emphasize again, the decisions that we as an industry make whether that's individual uh, enterprises making choices of technologies, whether that's Red Hat and what we offer and how we catalyze in our communities, whether that's other partners and IT vendors and what and how they decide to build their offerings, the next 24 months will determine how cloud develops. It will determine how that value is created and how that value is shared. The technologies are clearly changing but technologies in and of, of themselves can have value. Those aren't the fundamental underlying changes that'll drive massive innovation um, that I think we can expect of a paradigm shift like that. 
this is the time that we need to make those decisions. This, we have an extraordinary opportunity, we as an industry, to fundamentally transform and accelerate the value that we can add for the companies um, in which we work or serve or the societies in which we live. And so it's gonna be a, a, a great ride and I look forward to the next couple of days where we can tell you a little more in detail about how we're putting these principles to work and, and the value propositions that we're looking to deliver. So with that, again, let me say welcome to the Red Hat Summit and JBoss World. We're thrilled to have you here and I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you.